Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session of the uh, Book Fair here in Sharjah, named, as you'll see on the screen behind me, the racetrack. Fittingly, as the racetrack and horse racing is the underlying theme through the novels of Felix Francis and before Felix, his father, Dick Francis. Horse racing being very close to both of their hearts, and Felix, it's good to see you in the UAE. Thank you, Terry. It's lovely to be here. Talking about Felix Francis, the writer, when we begin, I think we have to mention the fact that you have continued a legacy left by your father. We can't talk about your career as a novelist without talking about your dad, who went into writing through journalism after a life as a champion jockey. Well, it was a result of a, one particular incident in, uh, in the 1956 Grand National, which uh, set him on a writing uh, career. He, he was, he rode for the Queen Mother. He wasn't the only champion jockey. So this is, can we? He wasn't just a champion jockey. He was, he, he rode for the Queen Mother and the Queen uh, in England. And he rode a horse of the Queen Mother's called Devonlock in, in the greatest steeplechase in the world, the, 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 the Grand National. And uh, the Grand National is four and a half miles round. Uh, you go round the Aintree Racecourse twice, it's four and a half miles. And my father had gone all but 40 yards when the horse he was riding collapsed underneath him, when he was just, he was 10 lengths in front and seconds away from winning the Grand National for the Queen Mother. And uh, it was that event. I mean, someone wins the Grand National every year, but to lose it in such dramatic fashion uh, was rare indeed. And it was that that set him off on uh, um, a, a career of, of writing. First, as you say, as a journalist, and uh, then as, uh, it, was, it was actually started because he wrote his autobiography. Um, Which I think was called The Sport of Queens? The Sport of Queens, yes. The, the Queen Mother allowed it to be called The Sport of Queens, racing being known as The Sport of Kings. And uh, <coughs> it was that event which my father always said that he probably owed more to it in, later, in the fact that the horse had not won uh, in later life than he would have done if the horse wins. Now, upon his retirement, he, he took up a job as a racing journalist in newspapers. Do you know why he made the switch from journalism <coughs> to being a novelist? Well, my mother um, always said to him, uh, said to him in 1961, she said, well, Dick, uh, um, you know, not, being a journalist is not as lucrative as being a jockey and uh, you know the carpets are beginning to wear out and the cars are beginning to break down and you always said you were going to write a story and now's the time to do it and she helped him and together they produced a, a book in 1962 called Dead Cert uh, which um, I'm glad to say went uh, into, the, into the bestseller list straight away and there was another book every year for the rest of the millennium. And reading some back history as I have, uh, you were probably always destined to be involved here somewhere. You told the story once about the Francis family, the conversation at breakfast time <laughs> wasn't about what we were doing that day, but <laughs> about the plot that was currently being... Yes, uh, it was more whether Sid Halley could survive the night with a 38 slug in his guts, with his blood dripping through a crack in the linoleum floor, yes. Uh, or how much high explosive was required to blow up a little aeroplane. Um, indeed, I was eight years old when the first novel was, was written, and I, I grew up in what I've always considered to be one of the great fiction factories of the 20th century. And uh, it was an exciting time uh, to live at home. My father, of course, being an author, he, he was at home most of the time. My brother and I would ride ponies in the field behind the house, and... Uh, we could always tell whether things were going well because um, if, he, if the writing was going well, he'd be sitting at his desk typing away. He, he typed with only two fingers, as I now do. Uh, people say to me, why don't you type with all ten? You go quicker. But I can only think as fast as I can type with two. Anyway, my father would be typing away and my brother would be, and I would be riding the ponies. And if it, it was all going well, as I said, he'd just be typing. And if things weren't going well... Uh, he'd open the window and he'd shout, get your heels down, boys, sit up straight. And, of course, he wanted us to be horsemen, whereas, of course, we wanted to be jockeys. 
and there is a difference sometimes. <laughs> well, while you were always involved, you actually started your own professional career in <coughs> academia. In, in uh, yes, I became a. I wanted to be a pilot, actually, but I had a lot of hip trouble when I was 15 years old, and that stopped me riding. And ultimately, it stopped me being a pilot as well because of the medical requirements. And uh, I went into teaching, and I taught um, uh, advanced level physics in England for 17 years uh, and loved it. But I, I started working for my father as well, uh, helping to manage his affairs. And in the end, he said to me... Uh, uh, would you give up your day job? And I said, yeah, but you don't pay me for what I'm doing for you. And he said, I'll pay you twice what you're getting now. So I thought about it, it for a bit. Easy decision. Well, it was not that easy a decision. I was giving up my career. And by the time my father said that to me, he was 70 years old. So, you know, you had to, be, you had to wonder how much longer it's likely to go on. You mentioned about you wanted to be a pilot, which made me think, as we've already outlined the Francis books were a family affair and there is a story about how your mother threw herself into the research so much so for one of the books based around flying she got a pilot's license is that correct that is correct my father was a pilot as well before he was uh, a jockey but he I was taught to fly at the expense of the government I know what you're thinking you know how did this lot come out of a jockey but um, before my father was a jockey he he was um, in the RAF he was a wartime um, Spitfire pilot and uh, Wellington and Lancaster pilot and uh, when he wrote a book, when my parents wrote a book called uh, Flying Finish uh, in 1966 um, my father needed to get some information about flying and he went along to the flying school in Oxford and they said oh come and have a few lessons Dick, you'll soon get your licence back and my father uh, quipped that it wasn't really much fun flying when no one was shooting at you. So, but my mother um, said that she wanted to learn to fly. And indeed, she became one of the top women qualified pilots in, in Britain and wrote a couple of books about flying as well. So, but yes, the, the, the books were definitely the family business. I mean, in one of the books, there's a physics teacher, and that's me. And in another book, my brother is a, uh, is a, who runs a racehorse transport business is in that. Uh, my uncle was a wine importer, and uh, my parents read a book called Proof, which was all about the wine trade. My father always said that it was the book he enjoyed doing the research on more than any other, and he'd been researching it for 40 years. Um, and uh, um, also that we had friends who were artists and photographers, and everyone seemed to uh, have uh, themselves... Uh, involved in the books, and, and I feel I'm, I do the same now. I mean, I was at um, Sharjah today listening to you, you were commentating, and I've got a friend in England who's a commentator, and I put them into uh, a book, into Bloodline. So, yes, very much the family business. One of your first <coughs> main <coughs> roles in helping with the books, <coughs> you designed a bomb. Ah, yes. You, um, I shouldn't say that if I'm... Uh, wanting to fly home with Emirates, but I've designed a bomb to blow up an aeroplane in, in rat trays. I was a 17-year-old physics student at the time, and uh, I was away at boarding school, and uh, I used to have to write a letter home every week. And my letters would be really short, like, you know, Dear Mum and Dad, I hate it here, please send cash, love Felix. And uh, when my mother wrote to me and said, could I tell her how to uh, create a, a remote control bomb uh, to blow up an aeroplane. Uh, I wrote 10 sides of, uh, of A4 paper back with all the instructions. Uh, and indeed, I created it without using the high explosives, I hasten to add. Uh, but we, uh, um, I, I produced the, uh, the detonating um, system. And it was all pre-electronic. You don't, you don't realise how everything changes. Um, I wrote the computer program in Twice Shy, and it was really what I thought was really cutting edge at the time. But uh, when I read it now, it looks terribly out of date. It was written back in 1980. And to tell you, you know, the example of how much it was out of date is that my daughter, um, having read it, said to me, what's a cassette? 
uh, so you realize that uh, uh, things move on. They certainly do. They certainly do. Now, your dad, with the help of your mum, produced a book every year for a lot of years. Every year, um, well, the 1962 was the first, and then 64, so there was a gap there, but then there were two books in 65, and there was one every year for the rest of the uh, 20th century. Uh, 39 books, 39 mysteries, plus uh, one autobiography, which we talked about, Sport of Queens, and another biography of Lester Piggott. Um, so all together, my father and mother together wrote 41 books uh, until um, the year 2000 when um, the last book was shattered and uh, the, my mother and father announced that they were going to retire. They actually wanted to retire the year before. And uh, every July, we would go to... Uh, Ascot to the Royal Box at Ascot because my father he rode for the Queen Mother and the, the incident of Devon Lock meant that they became very good friends and my father used to take the first book off the press and give one a copy to the Queen Mother and also a copy to Queen Elizabeth um, the second and uh, they would he produced the book in, in 1999 and handed it over to the Queen Mother, who was really excited, and she said, Dick, I'm so looking forward to my book next year. Now, my, parent, my father had always said to her that he would love to dedicate one of his books to her. And she used to wag her little finger at him and say, only when I'm 100. And, of course, in the year 2000, she was going to be 100. So my parents, who had decided that they were going to retire, suddenly had to go home and, 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 and think, oh my goodness, we've got to do it all again. So the 2000 book, Shattered, uh, which was very well named, I might say, because they were absolutely shattered by the experience. And they announced that they were going to retire. Uh, my mother hadn't been well for many years. She had polio uh, when she was 25 years old. And uh, my father was nearing 80. And they announced their retirement. Sadly, my mother's long and happy retirement lasted for less than a month uh, before she suddenly died of a heart attack. Um, so, and that was that. As far as everyone else was concerned, that was the end of the Dick Francis books. Well, as a fan, that's what I thought too. But then, six years later, it was announced that Dick Francis was back behind the typewriter. And you had quite a deal to do with that. Well... Um, the story is, is that in about in 2004, late 2004, so we're talking 10 years ago now, uh, my father's literary agent asked me to have lunch with him. Now, that was not unusual. I was, his, I was my father's manager. And uh, so we had lunch and he said, Felix, we've got a real problem. No one is reading the books. All those wonderful stories, 39 wonderful stories, um, and no one is reading them. And the reason why no one's reading them is because they're not available in the bookstops. Uh, when the, the, the people who buy for the bookshops to put them on the shelves are, for, for the corporate side of, of the bookstores, they're, they're straight out of university and there hasn't been a new book for, for five years. They've forgotten about Dick Francis. I mean, when I was a, a kid at school, the books that kept me awake at night were by people like uh, Alistair MacLean and Hammond Innes and Neville Shute and Desmond Bagley. You can't buy one of those today. I mean, in England, I don't know what it's like here, but I mean, I've looked through, walked through the, the book fair just now, and it's just mind-boggling. In England, uh, well, in the Great Britain, there are a thousand books published every week. That's 50,000 books published in a year. And walking through now, you see that all, every other country is... Well, the bookstores do not have room to stock the new books, yet alone the old books. And what was happening to my father's books were exactly the same as happened to those other authors, that they were disappearing from the, from the bookshops. And Andrew my father's literary agent said, what we need is a new book 
a new hardback, a new Dick Francis book, to stimulate the interest in the backlist. Well, I said to him, you know, you're not going to get one. I mean, you're living in Cloud Cookie Land. My mother, who worked with my father, has died. My father is now 85, and, uh, and it's not going to happen. And, and Andrew said, no, what I want to ask your permission is to ask an established British crime writer whether he would write a Dick Francis novel by so-and-so. Well, I must have had a few glasses of red wine at the time because I looked at the agent and I said, well, before you ask anyone else, Andrew, I would like to have a go. And he didn't roll his eyes and say, don't be ridiculous. He just said, I'll give you two months to write two chapters. And I went away and wrote the two chapters and uh, took them back. And he said, there's two things you've got to do. You've got to go and talk to your father. And you've got to get on and finish it. So I went to see my father and he said, and I said, Dad, no one's reading the books. We, we need a new, um, a new hardback. No, he said. I said, it could be about race fixing, which was topical with trials and stuff going on in England. No, he said. I said, it could be a Sid Halley book, and Sid Halley was a recurring character. No, he said. Uh, I said, I'll help you like Mum used to help you. No, he said. And I said, I've got a title. So he said, what title? So I said, under orders. And he read the two chapters. He got quite interested when I'd done five chapters, it went uh, to the publishers in New York and London, and they got very excited. And uh, the book came out in 2006 as a Dick Francis, but uh, that was my book. A couple of layman's questions. Obviously, being an academic, you were used to writing, but writing academic tomes is much different <laughs> to writing fiction. <coughs> yes. The only and fiction I'd written before was school reports. <laughs> and when you sat down to write it, were you conscious all of the time, I have to make this sound like my father? Oh, yes, I think so. I mean, I, I chose to write it about Sid Halley. And people say, why do you copy your father's style? Well, I may have done so at the beginning, but um, it's the style I grew up with. You know, I was eight years old when the first book was published. And uh, I read them all as, as they came out, and in fact, before they came out. And uh, it's, it's more the way I write anyway, rather than purposely choosing to copy him. Yes, I do write in the first-person narrative. In other words, it's all seen through the eyes of the main character. And that was, I chose to do that purposely because my father had done it before. But it may not have been a Dick Francis book, because as you say, every other book was in the first person, I think. Well, it, w it had to be in the first person, uh, of course. And, and I, mean, I like writing in the first person. Um, it has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, one of the big advantages is that you don't need Dr. Watson. In other words, you don't need someone in order to describe what is going on in your mind because, it can, because it's in the first person, you can write it just by what you're thinking. It has disadvantages as well. The disadvantages are that you, it, everything has to be a continuous timeline and you can't put anything in the book which the main character doesn't actually witness. You can't say, meanwhile, over in Dubai, so and so was happening, because if the character, if it's written in the first person, the character can't know about it unless he's actually there. Uh, so yes, I did do that. Um, I, I hadn't written an awful lot um, beforehand. I mean, I'd written a few things for Dick Francis' books, um, but I was a physicist, so um, I didn't, wasn't writing a, a huge amount. But I always say that physics is the study of the great invisibilities of life. It's the study of, of electricity and magnetism and, it, and sound and radiation. All the things you know are there, but you can't see... And I always feel, therefore, that you need a degree of imagination to be a physicist. And, of course, that helps when it comes to writing books. The research. Your mother and father worked together. Your mother did a lot mm. of the research. That's been well written. And then you took it over. You must learn a lot 
in researching all of these books? Well, you do. Um, you, um, I keep my eyes and ears open, and I ask a lot of questions. Um, and it, it is, it's true. I mean, this, the second book, I mean, having done Under Orders, it was really as a book to stimulate the backlist. It went to number two on the London bestseller list, number three on the New York Times list. It was number one in Los Angeles, and suddenly there was talk of the, uh, by the publishers that they wanted another book. Well, I was having lunch with the, uh, with the publisher shortly after um, Under Orders was published, and uh, he said... Um, I said, well, come on, is the book on every shelf in every bookshop? As you know, every author thinks that their book should be on every shelf in every bookshop. And uh, uh, he said, well, one of the problems we have is that there are so many bloody cookery books. You know, there's everything, every book, you know, there's Jamie Oliver, that we've just been looking at someone here who's, uh, who does cookery demonstrations and writes cookery books. And there is, there are, hundreds of cookery books. And I think I know where this is leading. And anyway, uh, uh, the publisher said the real problem is we can't get any room on the shelves because of the damn cookery books. So I, so I decided at that point that I would write Dead Heat, which was about a chef. You know, if you can't beat them, join them. So uh, I wrote uh, Dead Heat, and, and um, that was all a great, also a great success uh, um, on the bestseller list. And then there was talk of a two-book deal, and, and now Damage, uh, which uh, you've got a copy of there, which is the, uh, the latest one just out, uh, is my ninth book, and it's actually the 50th Dick or Felix Francis book, so, um, and I'm already working on the 51st. Now, you've remained topical. Damage, we'll talk a little more about in a moment, but it's topical. There's been a fair deal in the press in recent time in the United Kingdom about skullduggery in horse racing. Um, the last book that you wrote with your father, Crossfire, was topical at the time because it was talking about a veteran of Afghanistan. Well, um, I decided I wanted to use a, a soldier, uh, not least because my son was a soldier. My son is a soldier. And indeed, when I was writing that, he was serving in Afghanistan. So uh, I was a little bit worried that I would... It, that, the, the character loses um, part of his right leg in a, uh, an explosion. And I was very worried that it would be prophetic and, and my son uh, would, have, would suffer the same. But because I, when I wrote Under Orders, I had a, a horse which was a three-time winner of the Gold Cup, the Cheltenham Gold Cup, which drops down dead of a heart attack. It actually drops down dead of a heart attack immediately after the race, which, of course... Um, happened in the Melbourne Cup uh, only last uh, Tuesday. Um, but I, I wrote about this three times winner of the Gold Cup, had done it, and between the time I, pub I wrote the book and it was published, a three time winner of the Gold Cup in England called Best Mate dropped down dead on a race course of a heart attack. And then in, uh, in Even Money, I wanted to um, have a reason why a man's father and mother would have died a long time ago um, in Melbourne, again, Australian co contact, context. And I decided that, I, I tried to think, what could I make up about these people's death? And I came up with the idea of swine flu. Well, between the time I wrote it and it was published, swine flu hit the, the, the newsstands, and, as it were. And then also in Dead Heat, I wrote... Uh, about the, my character, the chef, uh, Max Morton. He, uh, he food poisons all his customers and the Food Standards Agency shut down his restaurant. And lo and behold, if anyone knows anything about England, there's a man, there's a very famous chef called uh, Heston Blumenthal who food poisoned all his guests at his restaurant and the Food Standards Agency closed it down after I'd written this in the book. And I remember my copy editor... Um, ringing me up and saying, for goodness sake, don't write about a copy editor who dies of a heart attack. <laughs> so I promised to write a book once with a copy editor who wins the lottery. Well, I'm very uh, glad you didn't but, kill off Mark Shillington. Well, but, uh, <laughs> Shilly, Shilly, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I wrote about 
in, in Crossfire about the, the, um, the soldier losing his leg, then I was rather worried that my son would come back without a leg, but fortunately that didn't happen. But at the same time, my father had, uh, had uh, a leg amputated, so I was very well aware of, uh, of what it involves in, in terms of uh, both practical and emotional um, uh, injury. Do you find the idea for a book will come to you like that? Or do you actually sometimes have to stop and think, what am I going to write about? Well, I'm, the next one? I'm having to stop and think, what am I going to write about at the moment, about the new one, because it's, it's not coming to me. But sometimes you, uh, sometimes you ask a question and you get an answer um, which sets you off on a, on, on a way... I mean, I, uh, there's a book um, over there called Gamble, um, and uh, I, I have a, 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 a my cousin's son is a, a financial advisor, and I asked him whether he would show me around his offices. So we were walking around his offices, and he is a an investment manager for individuals who've got quite a lot of money. And as we were walking around the offices, I turned to him and said. OK, Ned, how do you steal the money, you see? And he actually said, we can't. We can't. It's absolutely impossible. You can't. And I said, come on, you must be able to steal the money if you really want to, all, the, all these rich investors that you're dealing with their money. He obviously wasn't working for bearings. No, well, it, well he, he absolutely said, you can't, you can't, you can't. So that was... Uh, so we, he showed me around the rest of the office. And as we were leaving, we went into his boss's office. Charles Pattinson, uh, who, who, after whom the company was named. And, I, and Ned introduced me to Charles, and I shook his hand, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, OK, Charles, how do you steal the money? Now, my cousin's son almost died on the spot. I mean, he was 26 years old, and here was his cousin asking his boss how to steal the money. And they, but the guy looked at me in the eye, and he said, oh, a dodgy um, land deal in Eastern Europe should do it. And suddenly I had a book. And those, those wonderful moments. Sometimes you even ask the wrong question and you get the right answer. I, I wanted to... Uh, um, I had a... Sh in, in Dead Heat, I wanted to uh, perhaps use horses as a means of smuggling drugs. Now, I don't know whether you know or have ever heard of uh, what are called drug mules, which are mostly ladies um, uh, who swallow um, condoms full of drugs and try and get them through the uh, um, customs. Well, I wondered whether you could do the same thing with a horse. Because, you know, as you probably know, a horse cannot be sick. It doesn't have the wherewithal to vomit. So once something is down in its stomach, it... It's not coming back up the way it went. And I thought that, I mean, some um, people can give drugs to horses by uh, coring an apple, putting the drugs in the apple, and then you just you twitch the horse's lip and then throw the apple down its throat, and once it's down, it's not coming back. And I thought, well, you could do, surely you could do this with drugs. Throw down loads of, of uh, cocaine-filled condoms and used the horses as the, as the way of doing it. So I had a, um, a, a vet came to uh, uh, lunch and I asked him the question, could you do this? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, it won't work. He said, uh, <coughs> a horse has a special bit of its digestive system, which is called a casa, which is like a big sack, which is where uh, grass will ferment uh, in, in order to get its nutrients. I mean, human beings don't eat grass because it's so, grass is so tough that it would, it, goes, it would go straight through the system and you'd never get any nutrients out of it because the human system works too quickly for grass. Now, cattle have a number of stomachs and they uh, regurgitate and, reach and, and chew the cud and, and that slows the system down. Well, in a horse, you have this sack which the grass goes in and it ferments away and the goodness is taken out of it and eventually uh, the, the, what is the waste rises to the surface 
and then it carries on through the system. Well, if you put drugs in the casein, they would simply fall to the bottom of the sack, and there they would sit until the rubber perished and the, and the horse would die of cocaine overdose. Damn it, I thought. That was, I thought it was a really good idea, and, and that was out of the window. And he turned to me and he said, but I've got a much better way of smuggling the drugs in a horse. And you'll have to read even money to find out what it is. <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't want to embarrass anyone, but it's, uh, you have to use female horses, so we'll work it out. Mm. But it's, uh, it was asking the wrong question, but getting the right answer. And uh, that, uh, that's lovely. And uh, with... Um, with the, with the book which has got the commentator in, which has got my friend Terry here. Is, uh, so I'm glad you didn't kill him off. I didn't kill him off. I killed off his sister. Um, he commentates on a race, and, uh, which is his twin sister is riding, and he is convinced, having commentated on the race, that she didn't win the race on purpose. And uh, because she did what they used to do as children. So uh, that was how that started. And it started because I, I stood behind a commentator and watched him work and thought... And after the race, he was telling me that while the race was going on and he was commentating, he was thinking about something else, which I found to be absolutely fascinating that he could, he could commentate on a, a five-furlong dash with... 20 runners which coming towards you and you imagine what trying to do that uh, especially in the mud when the horse's colours are getting things kicked up and at the same time be thinking of other things and, uh, and I wanted it to, uh, to be able to use uh, the techniques of television commentary mm. well and, and television itself mm. to, in order to catch the uh, the, the perpetrator. But as you say, the skullduggery in racing, I actually think there's more skullduggery in my books than there is in reality. But everyone th likes to think there isn't. I, most racing people would agree with you, yes, but uh, they do make very, very good stories. What about the process of writing? You've got the idea, or you've got the kernel of an idea. Where do you go to from there? Well... Um, I normally have, I have to have the, the idea of the beginning of the book. I don't know who do, who's done it at the beginning. Um, I tr it's a job of work. I mean, I do, it's a full-time job, and I try and write a thousand words a day. And I should have written a thousand words today, even, but I went to the races instead. Um, that was my fault. And... Um, Sometimes it comes easily and you get, it fin you get a thousand words done by lunchtime and then you carry on and you've maybe done 2,000 by the end. Other times it's really very tough and you only do a few hundred. But it's, um, I don't know where the whole book is going. I know that my main character will prevail uh, but, and I know perhaps that I'm going, say, I'm going to London but I don't know which routing I'm going to take yet. And it's a bit like, you know when you go to the circus and you watch the guys spinning plates and they spin plates on poles and they put a whole load out and then when one begins to wobble right at the end they come and do this just in time and you know, and we've all seen those sort of acts. Well to me writing a book is a bit like that at the beginning and every plate represents a character with a story attached. So you start the book by putting out the characters. If you only have two characters and one of them is, the, is the, your main, your hero, it's not very difficult to work out who done it, is it? So you have to have a lot of characters and it's like putting out plates and you, when a plate begins to wobble you have to go and write a little bit about that character and so the first half of the book is putting them out and the second half of the book is like bringing them back, stacking them together where characters overlap and, and eventually at the end of the book you should end up with one stack and that's the denouement, everyone's story 
comes together in one thing. And you hope that you haven't left one wobbling over the side here, because if you have, someone will write to you and say, what happened to Uncle Joe? On your road to London, do you run into many dead ends and suddenly find yourself having to go into the reverse? Um, in my mind, yes. I suppose another way of saying that is, do you use the waste paper basket very much? Um, I occasionally have, yes. I did throw away quite a lot of one section of refusal. Uh, but uh, mostly it's because I am trying to write and I don't exactly know where I'm going. Therefore, I'm floundering around a bit uh, in the book. And, and I am floundering around at the moment in the next book. Uh, I've got a little bit of, I've got an idea of, uh, I've got a, a start and I've, I've done 10% of the book, therefore I've done um, the start. And, um, but one of the problems with writing in the first person is you, that not only is your, your investigating character, your main character, have to do the investigation and find out who did it, he has to also find out what it is that they've been doing. So, um, and at the moment, my character has no idea what's been going on. He's just been, as it were, involved in the fallout of something that's going on. And he's going to have to work out exactly what is going on in order to work out who's doing it. I'm not going to give anything away here, but this is the opening of uh, Damage. I've had the test results and the news isn't good. I couldn't get the words out of my head. Now, the Francis books are famous for gripping first sentences. Yes. How much work do you put into that? Well, um... You, you, need, you want to get... Pe pe if you go to a bookshop and you watch people as they buy a book, they pick up the book off the... Can you pass the book? They, what they do is they pick the book up off the shelf and they look at the front and then they turn it over and look at the back and then they look at the inside of the front cover and maybe the inside of the back cover and then they turn to the first line. I've had the test results and the news isn't good. Now, the idea is you give them a first line, which means that they don't do that. My father wrote a book called Nerve, and the first line was, Art Matthews shot himself loudly and messily in the centre of the parade ring at Dunstable Races. Now, you're not going to be able to put that back on the shelf, are you? And that's the... Uh, um, the idea, in fact, I, I can tell you the first line of the next book, if that would be, uh, uh, which is the one I'm writing at the moment. And uh, it is, the, temp the, the thermometer on the wall read 105 degrees. 105 degrees centigrade, that was. 216 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the first line of the book. And how long did it take you to produce it? They come to you uh, quite a long, you know, you, you think up a first line and, uh, I mean, some of them are quite simple. I wrote a book called Silks, which was a, a play on words. It was a barrister who was also a jockey. So um, in England, a barrister, a, a senior barrister is called a silk because they wear a silk gown and obviously jockey silks. And the first line of that was easy, guilty. Um, and... But you, you, you want to try and grab people, but um, the first line does take a, quite a lot of time, but it's, uh, it's easy compared to the last line. The last line is the line which you want people to read the last line and go... And you want them to feel that they want a bit more. And that's, you know, I, I always think the art of good authorship is not to give them too much, but equally not to give them too little. I have a friend of mine in England who um, is a... Uh, he's actually a lord of the realm and uh, a very intelligent man. And uh, he ran um, one of the biggest companies in Britain uh, for many years, his chief executive. And he said to me... I'd, I'd given him a copy of... of 
the book Silks. And Silks, the, the main character at the end, he rather takes his, the, the law into his own hands with the aid of a baseball bat. And he's, um, he might say that he possibly has taken self-defense a little bit too far. And it ends on the fact that the police are coming down the driveway and that's the end of the book. And this very good friend of mine said to me, Felix, he said, uh, tell me, what happens to Jeffrey after the end of the book? Now, I've spent all this time trying to convince my readers that my characters are real people and I'm writing a real story about them. And the last thing I wanted to do was to turn to him and say, well, Ian, Jeffrey doesn't really exist. So I didn't say that. I said to him, well, what would you like to have happened to Jeffrey after the end of the book? And he goes, no, 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 no. What really happens to Jeffrey after the end of the book? So I thought about it for a bit and I said, uh, well, he got off. And he looked at me and he said, how the hell did he manage that? <laughs> so you can't win. And, and um, I mean, well, I used to have a cleaner at home who used to be forever vacuuming, bashing my chair even when I was trying to write. And I remember saying to her one day, her name was Patsy, and I said, it's all right, Patsy, you continuing with the vacuuming, I'm going to go make myself a cup of coffee. I'm having real trouble with the ending anyway. And she stopped her vacuuming and she looked at me and she said, Felix, what do you do if the end doesn't come to you? Do you make it up? So I didn't have the heart to tell her I made it all up. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you live with these characters as real people. And, and one of the real... What I think you need to do in order to write a, a, a novel, a, a good novel, whether it be a mystery novel or a romantic novel or any sort of story, is, is that you know, if you want people to read it, you, they've got to care about the characters. And when I say care, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to like them, but they've got to care what happens to them. And any book, be it mine, I hope, and, you know, go back to Jane Austen, people want to know what happens to the characters. Uh, the character has to go on a journey. The character has to be a different person at the end than they were at the beginning as a result of the events that took place in the book. And uh, that to me is, is fundamental. If, if the reader doesn't care about the character, then when they go to sleep at night, they'll put the book down and they won't bother to pick it up in the morning. And there's nothing better than to have someone come up to you and say, Felix, you kept me up until half past five in the morning reading your, finishing your book. And you know, part of me thinks, oh my God, it took me a whole year to write that and they've read it in one night. But actually that's what you want. And that is what I think writing in the first person helps that. And I like to feel that my books are, um, well, you want them to be unputdownable. So. Well, just talking about characters for a moment made me think, your dad only ever had two recurring characters, Sid Halley and Kit Fielding. Yes. Sid Halley you used as the impetus to restart the Francis legacy. Yes. Of the books you've written since, is there a character you'd like to reprise or you're giving some consideration to reprising? Well, um, the character in Damage is appearing in the next book um, because my, both pub my publishers in New York and in London, they're both adamant they want to see more of him. And, of course, Refusal was the second book I wrote about Sid Halley and I've had to promise people that Sid Halley will be back you um, can't be getting any younger. No, but Sid is, is, Sid is rather lucky because he doesn't age as quickly as the rest of us. <clears throat> in fact, um, between his first and second appearance, uh, which was 15 years, he only aged six months. And another 15 years later, he was only another six months older. He has aged a bit quicker uh, between under orders and refusal, but... Uh, but even though he himself doesn't age, he's up to date with modern technology and, you know, the, the books are not still set in, in 1965. 
Um, but after all, that's what fiction is, isn't it? I mean, um, you use a character, and uh, uh, it's a wonderful thing about writing books with fiction books is because that everyone does exactly what you tell them to do. You know, it's just not like real life where people don't do what you say. Uh, it, it is just... Uh, um, it's, it, Debbie always complains that she loses me for months because uh, I live in a parallel universe. I mean, I go to the races and people <laughs> ask me, have you got a good tip? You know, who's going to win? Well, when I write about races, I know who's going to win before I start. So I'm the world's worst tipster when it comes to real life. Just returning to Sid for a minute made me think um, he ha is a recurring character, but of course he had a lot to do with bringing Dick Francis's stories <laughs> to the small screen. I can yes. still remember the uh, knob on the steering wheel of the Triumph sports car, was no, it? No, it, it was a Jensen, I think. Oh, um, um, I am showing my age. Well, um, yes, that is why Sid was a recurring character, because... Uh, ITV in England, um, Independent Television, did a, uh, a series uh, called The Racing Game. Uh, and my, they used the first book for the first story. And my father wrote five more stories. And he wrote the storylines and someone else wrote the scripts. And um, my father said that watching Mike Gwillem, who was the actor, was just like watching Sid Halley. And therefore... Dad said, I've got to write another book about him. And that was Whip Hand and, and then Sid has been back before. But Dad always said he didn't really like using recurring characters um, because uh, it meant that, you know, how do you fill the pages up? Running out of time, but just one, right. thing with, one thing with Sid, you mentioned earlier there's no Dr. Watson. There is in the Francis books. What, you mean Chico Barnes? Chico Barnes. Yeah, but... Um, I know he doesn't get a say, but he's yeah, the but, Watson. But Chico Barnes is, is his assistant, but he's not... I mean, if you read the, the uh, Sherlock Holmes books, I mean, Watson is forever talking through the plot True. with Dr. Watson because, it, because it's not written in the first person. You can't see what's going on in the character's head. I know. But... Well, Felix, I think we've just about run out of time. Thank you very much for your time. Well, it's a we've pleasure. We've all enjoyed it. It's been a, a real pleasure speaking to you. Damage is out now, and when you get going again in 12 months' time? Yeah, well, the, the new one is due at the publishers on the 1st of March, uh, which is rather worrying because, you know, I, I happen to know it's only... Um, 113 days to go. No, not that I'm counting or anything. Uh, and uh, um, I've got a lot of work to do between now and then. I would look forward to seeing a copy and checking your memory of the first line. Ladies and gentlemen, Felix Francis. Thank you, Terry.